third one? Oh, no. Uh -huh. Sorry. Go ahead. I made up that last one. Yeah, all in one week. Uh, yeah. Uh, the subjects for their poetry so far, the very first week was um, from a, a textbook called In the Palm of Your Hand by Steve Cohen, and the very first exercise was Recovering Childhood Memories. Oh. So that works very nicely, I think, with maybe what you're going to talk about today. So I'm going to turn it over to Joan, and she's going to uh, talk, and then maybe afterwards there'll be a chance for some questions. Hi. Okay. Thank you. All right, here's Joan. Really nice to be here today. I, I taught at North Seattle Community College quite a while and I taught creative writing in addition to why don't you just say your first names just so we have your names so I can hear them. Let me start. Jim. Max. Dan. <laughs> well, what I'm hoping to impart to you today is a capacity that I know you have that you may not have discovered yet. And it's what I discovered for myself uh, intuitively. And since we don't have a lot of time, this is my website, joanpizay.com. And on my website, under the publications section, there's, it's called the, the IFPE paper. It, it was a paper I presented using what we're going to talk about today, that, that I work with Vietnam veterans. And um, there's also an essay about my father called The Sadness of a Clown. If you're interested, um, you can read it there. So what is this capacity? Memory it, it fascinates me, and I left teaching in 1995 and got a degree in psychology, worked with Vietnam veterans for 10 years, then I got trained as a psychodynamic psychotherapist and learned a lot about memory. And th there's something called unformulated memory and implicit memory, and this is just like little dust motes that kind of travel around, and if we're really receptive and you put your iPhone away, <laughs> and give a quality of attention that we don't aren't usually invited to give that isn't frontal or executive function or so much left brain. The right brain, and the two lobes, of course, are very connected, but the right brain is shy, and the left brain will stand in front of it most of the time and organize things and do it the right way. But the, the right brain is organic and intuitive and random, and that's what you really want to invite for this capacity that I'm going to let you know you have. You may have already discovered it. This may be redundant, but if not. Um, and so implicit and formulated memory, just the little barely there inklings. And some of this is even pre-speech, even from infancy. And so it's not going to be photographic memories. But it will return to you in wisps and hints and hunches. And so the capacity I'm talking about is really receptivity for what usually gets kind of ignored um, because it isn't finished and it's, it's not going to offer you anything <laughs> except these little quiet invitations if you're receptive. So form. Um, I used this because the prose poem form, because it felt to me like, like a fence or a corral. And my parents um, were interesting people. <laughs> a lot of high drama in my life, not, and that's really not what's so important. Um, they, they were loving parents, but my father was a very anguished alcoholic, and he was a minister beloved by his parishioners who didn't guess at this until it got too late and then he would get kicked out and he'd get another church <laughs> because people were bewitched by him. <laughs> and my mother, <laughs> my mother had much the same kind of um, magic about her, but she was very ill. It turns out she was schizophrenic. 
And so how do you write about that? And I didn't feel that compelled to write about it. I, I, I did write about my parents, lots of poetry, but, but not in this way. So in 19, let's see, 86 it was, um, the Puget Sound Writing Project started at the University of Washington. And this is, was for teachers to go and, and learn how to write with their students. And at the time, I was teaching in the North Shore District in North Seattle. And um, nobody applied. And it cost $800. It cost the district $800, which was a lot of money. So I said, I'll do it. <laughs> and, and I did write with my students already. But, so I, I took this, and they had lap computers, and I'd never been near a computer. And we had writing time, 45 minutes every day. That's how we'd start yeah. out. And then they did writing groups. And, but there was something about this. And, and these little blips just kind of kept coming. And that's what Now the Day is Over is. Mm -hmm. And um, namesake is the same form. Because that's really how I can write about something like my parents, also the family atmosphere, also my own internal world, that isn't, it's just not a direct line. Some of them are quite organized, some of them are more like dreams, but there's something about this form, this boundary, this corral, that I remember back in 1986, it just felt safe and contained. So the prose poem is a, is a very valid form, and I was fortunate in the early 80s to take a <coughs> workshop at Centrum with Robert House. And he was then starting to write his prose poems. And he, he said, people say, well, what are you doing? <laughs> and he said, oh, these are just little things I'm writing. And he talked about the prose poem. And he said, <coughs> you can write a little essay. You can write a narrative. You know, you can just throw things in. <laughs> and then in his book, and, and I was going to check which one it was. Maybe it's the, the prose poem, Tall Windows, is in it. I'll, I'll have to find I will find an email down the title of his book. But, but many of his prose poems are in that. But he was just being very playful with it and, and not at all self-conscious and having a good time. <laughs> and that's how it's felt to me. And I, I've written some formal poetry. I don't think I've ever written a successful sonnet. <laughs> <laughs> Failed sonnet. Uh, but I remember Stanley Plumley once said, that a, a poem has been realized when its form and content are one, when you can't separate the form and content. And uh, that, that's always kind of intrigued me. So I just wanted to say a little bit more about form. Um, so the sonnet, and you've been writing them, and have you been doing the iambic pentameter at all? It's sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Galway Canal, Canal once had a wonderful essay about iambic pentameter. It's ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. And, and he said it replicates the mother's heartbeat, the first sound any of us ever heard. And that it's a return to that first sound. And so with Shakespeare, we expect it to be fairly, most of the time, reliable. <laughs> and to be or not to be, that is the question. Well, in Hamlet, um, Hamlet probably had PTSD, I think, because he, his father died, his father's ghost came and told him to murder Claudius, who had killed him by pouring this horrible poison into his ear. He hated Claudius. He was a mess. But Hamlet had been a fine, fine young man prior to this tragedy. But he was pretty traumatized. And who knows who Hamlet is? I mean, I haven't read it for a while, but, but I... I remember every time I would teach it, I'd think this is what I thought it was. So that's part of the brilliance of the play. But in, let's see, okay, so it's Act 3, Scene 1. So Ophelia is in love with Hamlet, and Hamlet's really struggling with his emotions. And he comes in, and his garters are falling down, his shirt's out, his hair's a mess. And we don't, nobody knows for sure if he was really kind of disintegrating or if he was acting to upset her because poor Ophelia suffered as well. So she says in this passage um, in scene one, he was the glass of fashion and the mold of form. So he was like a perfect sonnet, the person she was in love with. Not flawless, not a hair out of place. And then the line,
saying, this is what he's become. Like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh. Well, that doesn't scan. That's not the boom, ba boom, ba boom. Oh, here we go. Like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh. So, and I don't know all the anapests and everything. My math anxiety always gives me trouble <laughs> when it comes to meter. <laughs> but um, her, her horror and confusion really comes through. And there's an example of when, when the, the form and the content are one. So form is wonderful, and I think it provides, can provide a, an amazing antagonist that brings things out of us we didn't even know were there. And I'm really glad you're writing sonnets and villanelles and sestinas. But the prose poem, for me, I'm only talking about myself. It's just felt like a safe haven where whatever can enter in and have a boundary. How are we doing? Oh, we have time. Okay. So I gave you, um, oh, and this quote by Roca, his letters to a young poet, I think is so, so tied to what I'm trying to say. Try to raise the submerged sensations of that ample past. So it's the submerged sensations that are wisps and, and hunches. So if you think about crackers in childhood, what are some of the crackers you used to eat? Animal crackers. Animal crackers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Saltines. Saltines. Yes. Yeah, many, many. Many sides. Did you ever stuff them in your mouth? Yeah, like four at a time. Right, yeah. right. And then some water. I one time dipped saltines in pickle juice. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so there you get that, that sensation. So it's the sensory, and the right brain, that's where all the sensory, the senses live. Graham crackers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just yeah. yeah. go. Oyster crackers. Oyster, little tiny salt. Goldfish. Goldfish crackers. <laughs> So any of those that you remember eating, if, if you just will return, um, and I'm going to show you this little strategy I have, that will return it to you. The sensations, because language, I do believe, can be sensory and embodied. And, and it will, the sensation will find the language and it will return it to you. Maybe not the story of how it was to, to eat a saltine, but something that's down there and wanting to come up, will join with, with something now. So we're not just talking about retrieving literal memories, but sensations that then will grow our writing. Um, so it's very wide open and open-ended, and if this makes you really uncomfortable, don't feel you have to try it. <laughs> but the capacity is to welcome what usually doesn't get invited. Um, okay, so I'm gonna read this. I gave you this one. Magnum opus. Maybe I'll just read it off. Okay, so my mother was, um, how do you describe her? It was kind of incredible being her daughter because I, I really felt like a golden child and I was celebrated 24 7 and never really criticized. And that sounds great, except that that's really not life. And, um, mm -hmm. and then things were pretty chaotic with my parents, and so, and my father as well. My sister is six years younger, and I never were criticized or put down. I mean, we were really loved by them, but it was also sort of wacky. And so you sort of think as a child, well, if I'm this wonderful, what's this? <laughs> and and that, that sort of goes throughout both books, I think. But this magnum opus is my experience with paint by number. Has any of you ever tried that? The cover of the paint by number kit says, every man a Rembrandt. Inside it holds 10 tubes of oil paints, two brushes, and a printed white canvas with a ballerina standing on her toes, arms arced over her shoulders. The canvas looks like a jigsaw puzzle. Every section has a number to let you know what tube of oil paint to use to fill it in. I lay newspapers on the dining room table, then squeeze small blobs of oil paint onto lids of tin cans. First her green toe shoes, then I paint her legs. When I move far away, the ballerina's leg muscles stand out because of the oblong shapes of tan and lighter brown. 
It takes a long time to fill the spaces with a small brush, and sometimes the oil paint won't stay inside the lines. I fill in her light and green dark tutu, then stop. When I tell my mother I'm finished, she says I stopped painting at just the right time. She says this with her chin in her hand, as if she's in the Louvre, looking at the Mona Lisa. Later, she hangs my painting on the wall. She says, someday we will frame it. So this family atmosphere was one of, you stopped it just the right time. <laughs> Instead of, why don't you finish it? You know, maybe put it down for now, and, and then tomorrow, come back and finish it. But that would, I would get that feeling of, all right, that's enough, that we all do. I, I, think, I think there are rhythms to, um, William James actually has a wonderful essay about the second wind. That, you know, when we feel like that we kind of hit a wall, but if we're able to continue, we'll hit a second wind and even a third and fourth wind of energy that we didn't know we had. But I would very often hit that wall and then just quit. And that was wonderful. It was just the right time to stop. And uh, so that was my family atmosphere. And we all had a family atmosphere. And some people's family atmosphere, not that it's just one thing, but it was very ordered, but that can almost have its own stresses sometimes. And so I think the family atmosphere, you're not really thinking about how am I going to assess my family atmosphere, but that's your experience. And as writers, that's your material. And the other quotation that I shared with you by Wallace Stevens, he says, what is the poet's subject? I think this is across genres. I, I think, what is the artist's subject? It is his or her sense of the world. For him or her, it is inevitable and inexhaustible, even though it may be totally without reference to himself. So whatever formed us informs whatever we write or paint or music we write um, or create. And so this capacity is a way to mine that atmosphere. So I'm going to have you try this. you um, title of the book if you want to really go for this um, I'll, I'll tell you and, and it's still available the first edition is the best one you can get it for very little online so this is the cluster and you're going to just draw a little circle about the size of a 50 cent piece in the middle of a piece of blank paper gestures, like my mother, you know, that sort of staring out at the, I mean, that was something I saw a lot. <laughs> That's indelibly printed on my brain. Can you think of some gestures your parents did? Maybe quiet little gestures, just a posture thing or a way of, what, what do you remember? Uh, my dad crosses his legs when he stands. Uh-huh. Yeah. When he's standing? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a parent. I mean, it might be a grandparent, but somebody you you know was part of your tribe. My brother used to like pick his finger all the time. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's something you experienced a lot. My grandmother to look 
have everybody. She had a stiff neck. She had to turn her head. Uh huh. Her, her whole torso. Yeah, you know what you do. Right. It did. And see, just the way you said that. This is what I've learned recently from taking some training in somatic embodiment. Mm -hmm. That gets wired into us yeah. as children. So when you did that, I could tell you remembered somatically. And it's that somatic sensory connection you really want. Okay, so if you can think of a gesture, just something like that from somebody that you remember. And we're just playing at it here. If it doesn't work out right now, that's fine because I'm going to do the title of this great book that you <laughs> call it. But, um, so my mother's cupped hand. And then, can you think of a, a word that describes partially your sense of the, the family atmosphere? I would say shimmer for this particular vignette. And she said, you stopped at just the right time. I just felt like little Tinkerbell fairy dust. <laughs> And it all felt so good just to give up. Um, and my, you know, my family was really off kilter and off plumb. So you may have memories of atmospheres that that are more grounded, and that's good and fine. So you don't have to have a shimmering. And maybe family atmosphere is a new thought for you. But just sort of how it felt to breathe in the house <laughs> or the apartment or wherever you were. Maybe that's for you to just figure out later. But the family atmosphere is very rich. And it, and it connected to weather, too. You know, like rain and, and sounds on the roof or squeaky doors. Wooden screen doors that bang. All right. So in the middle of the cluster, you have you, you all have a, a gesture, some little something. Okay. And then this is not the same as mind mapping, which was big and <laughs> maybe when you were in grade school, some of you, where you know if you're going to write about the American flag, then you put everything related to colors and stars. And, you know, it's it's the opposite. It's just casting out your nets. So whatever comes into. So let's do this with something else, just so we get the idea. Is it okay if we do that about your grandmother, just to pretend that we all had sure, that? Sure, I'm going wild over here. So <laughs> okay, so you'd say she had a stiff, a stiff neck. Yeah. I mean, her neck didn't move. No. A fixed neck. Shoulder, head. Would you just say? No, just shoulder, head, complex. All right. <laughs> that was so. That was part of your family atmosphere. Uh, yeah. Her presence. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We don't know his grandmother, but we're pretending we all knew her. But we can all sense it, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was. And when did that start? How long did she live with you? Uh, <laughs> too long. Um, <laughs> long time. Probably, um, well, I moved out before she died, so. So all your growing up? I mean, pretty much, yeah. And what did you say caused it? Caused what? What caused the stiffness? Oh, she had a, um, she had a punch. Natural, yeah. I mean, arthritis mm -hmm. caused it, yeah. wasn't it? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so this is playful, these little things I'm writing. <laughs> um, so, what are just some associations that just kind of walked in in relation to this image of this stick? Anything? For me? Well, you could start, but we're all going to join in here. <laughs> okay, good.
bolster off of I me. Mean, does bison suggest anything? Low to, low to the ground. Going to do it for like three to five minutes and it starts to feel full, kind of full, like when you've had enough to eat. The way Mark described it, it seemed like she was focusing a, like a beam on yeah, you when she yeah. turned towards you. Yeah. Or those big lights that you would see that like the yeah, well, not even stage lights, but like at like a fairground or something. Yeah. Yeah. Advertising circuses. Yeah, they like see them. Searchlights yeah. crossing the sky. Okay. Yes. I just smell that old flowery, like that, that flower smell like old perfume. Old perfume. Mm. That's probably enough. Now, not to say that there wouldn't be details about this memory that are really connected. You, you know, that's fine. They don't all have to be so disparate. But you want lots of these, too. So you, you get that full feeling. <laughs> and then you start to write the vignette. And the vignette is not a paragraph. And Gabriel Rico, who wrote this book that I'm going to, it's called Writing the Natural Way, but I will write it on the board. She used vignette, because it's like a little sketch, because the paragraph, many of us were taught that a paragraph has a topic sentence, mm -hmm. and everything under the topic sentence supports that in various gradations of detail, and then there's a concluding sentence or a transitional sentence, and that's great for coherent writing. We want logic. <laughs> These aren't. I mean, some are more than others, but the right brain is really figuring it out. So we could either all try and write a vignette from this, or you could try and write your own. I'm just thinking about the time. Shall we just all try and write something from this and see what comes? I'll give you a choice. Okay, so you can either, and how, how do you write the vignette? You just pick up, it's like picking up a stitch. So Batman suggests something, and then you go back. And then while you're writing it, other things will pop in. And that's fine to take those, and you can completely abandon a cluster if you find yourself on a roll. It's a catalyst. But you might also find yourself including everything. So there's no one right way to do it, and you really can't, there's no wrong way to do it. But it's, you're using the form of the prose poem to contain whatever comes up. So either write a vignette from this, or your own memory, your own gesture that you have in the middle. And that's so you'll do your own cluster. Does that make sense? So let's all try and write something. Voice, you know, and all the things that are written. But how do we find our voice as writers? Well, your right brain is <laughs> wanting to speak because there's the voice is there. Yeah, not to, I don't mean to say you know everything is easy, but in a way it is. I mean, if you want to then sustain this and think it's one of peace, you know, and it's kind of like my mother. And there it was, just beautiful. Oh, so, you know, all your detail, I mean, your memory of your grandmother eating, it's like it just happened. And all of the writing you've shared, and I'm sure the writing that hasn't been shared has that same immediacy. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask, or anyone want to share? My, my name is Dan Peters. I'm an instructor at Yakima Valley Community College in the English department, yeah. and also the uh, co-owner and editor of Blue Begonia Press, along with my wife, Amy Peters. And uh, I did invite students from my uh, class here tonight. Several of them are going to be reading poems for you today, but several of them, if, they're, if their pattern holds, will be walking in about five minutes late. It's <laughs> <laughs> a possibility that they'll be coming still. Uh, our first poets tonight are from Yakima Valley Community College. They are members of the this quarter's creative writing class and uh, members, probably the most active members of the Yakima, or excuse me, YVCC's creative writing club as well. Uh, and 
I think I've had Tony, Tony Wells is going to be our first reader. I think I've had Tony in, this is a fourth class together, is that right? And I was thinking on the way here, sometimes when you're a teacher, you don't know if you're doing something right, if what you're doing is working. And knowing that somebody like Tony wants to keep taking classes from me is a very reassuring thing, because I always think she's got more going than I do. So uh, here's Tony Wells with our first poem tonight. Today, uh, Joan Fassay came in and we worked on nets, which are basically, you just kind of think of an uh, was it, emotion or a gesture of um, one of your parents or someone that you know, little and then you, mo. yeah, a little dust mode or a little detail, and then you build off of that, and so that's, I just wrote this this afternoon, so, um, it doesn't have a great title though, because I know you're picky about titles, so <laughs> I tried, <laughs> and it's called Black Fingernails. The arms of our red velour couch have lost all of their stuffing. Flat and hard after the move, they did nothing to support my mother's dainty neck, but she didn't seem to mind. The TV played Days of Our Lives, but her bloodshot eyes were focused elsewhere, staring at the off-white popcorn ceiling of our two-bedroom apartment. The chipped plate on my lap warmed my jean-clad legs. French toast and eggs for breakfast, her specialty. Mom, shouldn't I be at school, I asked. I remember being concerned as a first grader that I would miss something important and never leave town, like she did. She replied softly, just eat your breakfast, honey. I think I'll just close my eyes for ten minutes. Then I'll feel better, I promise. Days passed and she continued to lay on that couch, eyelashes collecting on her high cheek cheekbones as a result of her nervous habit of plucking them one by one like stray eyebrow hairs. We rarely left the house except to go to the grocery store, where we'd pick up eggs, milk, bread, the basics. Old classmates and neighbors would see her and rejoice. She was chatty patty to them, the enigmatic woman known for her days as drill team captain, the star of, class of 80, the star of the class of 84. They didn't see what I did. Her narrow hips, sharp enough to be a starving child's, the mascara permanently caked under her nails, the knots in her hair that hadn't seen a brush in days. They knew, though. They all knew what had happened. They would ask her, how are you holding up? Occasionally, they would glance down at me and Pinion and say, it must be very hard with the two girls being so involved, hinting at the question of where my older sister was, which my mother never answered. When we returned home, I'd help her to put away the, the groceries, listen to the obnoxious crackle of grocery bags being stuffed into an overfull garbage can. Shuffling back to her spot, she would slowly lower herself back down onto the couch, as if her mother's arth arthritis had already found a home in her. I couldn't hear it, but the quaking of her hunched shoulders was enough. Through her overly lipsticked mouth, she'd ask, You know I was the one that left your father, right, honey? You know that, don't you? I'd get up from the floor beside her and slowly trace my thumbs over her cheeks, hot to the touch, trying to find her freckles under the black streaks. I do, I'd say. I know. Joan visited our class today, and that was uh, an exercise that we did where she, she was talking about how her process of writing her, her stories. And it was uh, like Tony's, uh, the, what came out of that brief exercise was just amazing. And uh, you'll hear some of Joan's stories later, but uh, you have this way of uh, allowing people to speak uh, about their memories. It's just remarkable. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in my introduction to you as well. Um, our next reader is Barbie Wood, who is, I said, is a member of the YVCC uh, Creative Writing Club and really a force in that club. And uh, Barbie and I uh, first met each other at West Valley High School when I was a teacher there 15 or 16 years ago. And at West Valley High School, I had Joan's book, uh, Now the Day is Over, among other books that I had on my bookshelf there. And for a whole year, I decided I would read, at the beginning of every class, a poem at the beginning of every class from, from a book, and I would read that whole book, and then I would start on another book and read a poem from that book. And it just so happened that we were reading Death of a Salesman as we were reading Now the Day is Over, and the connection every single day between what was happening in that play and what was happening in your life story was amazing. And it, it made me think about uh, Barbie has known you for 15 years the same way that I've known your poetry for 15 years, but she just got to meet you today. Here's Barbie Wood. O 
Okay, so I actually have two, and I'm going to start with the one that we used in class today from the vignette. Uh, mine actually, it was really cool because we got to do it from either our own memories or what was written on the board from one of our other teachers. Uh, and it was a memory of his grandmother. If I can find it. Oh, you know what? I don't have it. Huh? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I wrote it on the back of the poem, the, the thing that we had. I didn't have it in my notebook. So I was, I was just teasing you guys with that one. <laughs> um, this one I actually wrote for tonight uh, because Namesake, it's a book about memories and her childhood and things that she's gone through. So I wrote some about mine. Uh, and it's titled, Barbies, Boys to Men, and Rent Checks. My childhood is an old black leather purse, the kissing lock protecting my greatest treasures, a silver token from Disneyland, Snow White on one side. From our trip where I growled back at the Yetis on the children's Matterhorn, and we smoked french fries like cigarettes. <laughs> Three My Little Ponies, I love their chubby, stubby legs and the fact that they were the only ponies who were mine. Mm. I wept, lip pooching, fat tears racing down my cheeks when the purse was stolen. I still occasionally dream that I found it again. Mm. My adolescence was a double-deck boombox, blasting Vanessa Williams and tape one, recording myself making fake radio shows, <laughs> playing them back to feel like even if it was only me, someone was listening. My life on tape was often disturbed by radio commercials and missing pieces of songs when I wasn't fast enough to push record. My adulthood has been a moving box, reinforced with duct tape on every seam. It yo-yos between empty and full, waiting for the next time it will be useful. The sides are worn, the flaps dog-eared from being folded under. I'm looking forward to the day I can unpack it for the last time. 